Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you again for tuning in to another one of our Friday night softer side sessions. I'm sure there's going to be uh, quite a bit more people watching tonight after the success of last weekend's uh, lockdown whiskey festival. And that is kind of the theme of tonight is the importance of the online whiskey community. I say theme, uh, my guests tonight know very well that we will often start a conversation about whiskey and it goes in a wide, wide direction. So there's no set questions tonight. There's no set topic. We're just going to have a chat about whiskey and whiskey online. Um, over the last couple of weeks, maybe over the last month or so now, the whiskey world has become an incredibly digital one. Yes, we'd been marketing on uh, social media platforms beforehand, but every aspect of drinking and uh, the whiskey industry has become online. Everybody's working from home. People are ordering their whiskey online for the most part. They're hanging out with friends online. And increasingly, brands like ourselves are taking to these platforms to reach out to yourselves, to talk about whiskey, to keep in touch, and uh, to talk about our brands a little bit more. But we were by no means the first people talking about whiskey online. And my guests tonight are really a, a, a great example of what has been going on online in the whiskey community for a long time. So tonight I'm going to be joined by Scott and Bart from the Scotch Test Dummies. Uh, Scotch Test Dummies, I just had a look a little over three years ago was the first time I had gone on an online YouTube channel with my colleague Scott Fraser and we had a chat and I've been on with them a few times since then and I'm also joined by Roy from Aquavite who many many of you will know from last weekend for being the host of the Lockdown Whiskey Festival and also known for his channel Aquavite which has been doing incredible things um, so we're just going to have a chat about that tonight pour yourselves a dram and tell us what you're having and ask any questions you've got. Good evening, gents. Good evening. How are you all? Phenomenal. Very well. Yeah. This is going to be a little bit of a, a, a guinea pig moment for me because the, the first three sessions that we've done have been very much me and one guest. To have three of you on and for one of them to be Bart is what? going to be a, <laughs> a challenge. No. <laughs> That didn't take long. That is one minute and three seconds, Bart. Well done. You you actually held back quite a lot there. Yeah, we're going to open with just yelling, was is los? So tell us that story, because there's going to be some people going, who is this German guy with a cowboy hat on? Sure. So technically, I'm German descent. Great-grandfather came here to avoid uh, fighting for the Kaiser, so we're talking like 19... 12 or 15, 14, 13, I think he jumped the ship. But um, the whole German thing happened when we're at Tomatin. You're, you're hosting us. You're giving us a tour. We come back to your visitor center. Uh, Scott and I, of course, were, were – uh, there he goes. Mention it. Go ahead. By the way, Scott's uh, handwriting is so much better when I – when I got my bottle, but we went and got our bottles uh, that are exclusive for Tomatin. Now I wander away and I think I'm paying for mine. Is that right, Scott? I don't, you know, I don't even, it was, yeah, it was, it was probably about the time that. Yeah. I think I'm paying for mine and um, <laughs> Scott, I can kind of hear Scott uh, talking to what were clearly an older German couple. And I can hear him convincing to go for that, to go for those special, uh, the PX. And, and he's in Scott's convincing. Well, and, what? Go ahead. Well, no, it doesn't. It doesn't work because of the, the, the German woman who, who you cannot tell what to do. This so is true. I heard her talking to her husband about the Oloroso distillery release. And so I merely say, 
try the PX because I thought I was an Oloroso man. Just yes. make sure you try the PX because I like it better than the Oloroso. Pushy American is what Scott came off as. Yeah, yeah you're gonna tell she her. Replies, I make my own choices. <laughs> <laughs> now, I think they're just kind of joking around over there. So I start yelling, you know, like was ist los, you know, what is up in German, and then snow, snow, hurry, hurry. And uh, and about that time, Scott hears this and thinks, oh my God, what is Bart doing in the visitor's center with our international folks that are in here buying whiskey? Maybe he's had a wee too much. Is that well, correct? my perspective on it was slightly different as well because <laughs> we, we had gone for dinner the night before and then we came to the distillery. And I think that was one of the few days on your trip that you were going to be going to two spots. And as things happen at Tomatin, we tend to run a little bit long. So we're in the warehouse having a few drams. And then Roy, who is on driver duty for the week, is kind of looking at his phone, looking at his watch. He's like, guys, we've got to go. We've got to we've got to make a move. Um, we were on our, you, you were on your way to Ballandalic, and I was very That's fortunate right. to jump in on that. Um, but we were talking about, is there anywhere on the way to get lunch? And there really wasn't, unless you wanted to sit down in a bar and have a meal, which would take another hour. So when you were in the shop, I said, I'll run down to the local shop and I'll grab us some sandwiches and a couple of cans of juice and and um, if that's okay. And you're like, yeah, yeah, go and do that. So I, I go down to the shop, leave you guys in the capable hands of our visitor center staff. And I walk back in <laughs> and you were standing there shouting in German. And I didn't even know what you were saying in German. I was just hearing German words. I was like... What, what happened in the five minutes that I was away? <laughs> I was yeah. really worried that they'd been pouring you big measures. But I, no, no, it was... Uh, now, <laughs> now, I will very... say it, it all ended very well because the Frau, once trying both of them, realized that Scott was spot on mm -hmm. and, and, and picked up exactly what was being suggested. So it was all good. Yeah, yeah. Now, that's actually something very interesting because when I was on with Roy, um, this would have been early December 2018, I think it was, Roy. We were having a chat about a presentation of whiskies and things. And that sounds I, right. I believe it was a question that came in on the chat, or maybe it was like one that you had yourself at the very end asking about um, have we noticed the influence of the online community on sales or anything like that? So we're talking about Ralphie's reviews and things like that. And I didn't really have an answer at the time. I was kind of stumbling about for an answer. And then a week later, Scott and Bart are doing their Mary Sherry shootout. And yes. the Tomatin uh, PX Visitor Center exclusive bottle won for both of you in the double blind tasting against some incredible shared whiskies. And I was like, oh, that's an incredible thing. And it was only about three, four months later that I realized how massive the online community is and how much respect that you gentlemen have built over your channels because we started going through that whiskey at a clip that we've never seen before. It was one of the more expensive casks in the visit center. It was one of the slower ones to move. But then once it had the seal of approval from the Scotch Test Dummies, it just started flying and it's it's not slowed down since. So um, yeah, the, the, there is, I have no doubt in my mind now about the power of the online community and what you guys have been building. Schnell. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, what is in the glasses tonight? What what are you, what have you poured tonight? You all look very on brand. There are a lot of tomato bottles. Thank you for that. Yeah. I have to say it, it wasn't requested. It wasn't required of us. We've chosen to do this. Scott is just, is just as an odd to use. You're, you're, you've been honestly one of the most open um, in terms of attitude and mindset and being kind of, um, you know, these maverick guys that do whiskey content from basements and spare rooms and bedrooms and things like that. It's, it's sometimes difficult and we understand that there are go there's going to be some nerves there. Uh, but you reached out very, very early on. So as a nod back to you, I'm, I'm on brand tonight and I've, uh, I've brought my uh, fairly small but nevertheless enjoyable tomato collection alongside me here. I'm star I've started with 
what I believe has come a bit of a cult whiskey, if you follow my channel at all, and that's the non-age statement entry level legacy. That's what's in the glass just now. Mm. Cheers. Yeah, that's what I've got as well right now. Cheers. I've got the uh, the twelve year, which was the first tomat that we ever had. Um, right. Extremely affordable, and what what Scott and I, or I'll say Bruno, I'll go with Bruno, Scott's last name. Bruno <laughs> and I learned from this was this was fairly early on for us, and I used to have a hard time picking up all the the cereal notes that would be in a scotch whiskey and this was the bottle that allowed me to really identify when i was picking picking those up the, the fresh mown hay and and those cereal uh, multi strong flavors that are in the 12 so and i've always when someone wants to you know they'll get a hold of us and say what do you mean by that note and again, I mean, I mean, it's a plug for you, but I say it all the time. I always tell them, go, go get the tomat in 12 because it's forefront and solid. You can get it and then you'll know what it is from there, there forward. Yeah. Yeah. There's no hiding from it in the 12 year old. Very, very multi forward. Yeah. And again, here, uh, echoing Roy, uh, Scott didn't make any suggestion to us at all as what to have out. And he probably wouldn't have minded if we had, Ardbeg sitting out here or, or Lafroig or McAllen or whatever. It's Friday uh, night. Enjoy what you're going to enjoy. Well, it's yeah. three o'clock for you guys as well. So first of all, I appreciate you joining us uh, earlier on in the day for you guys. I know you have a busy evening ahead with the Dalmore takeover that you've got tonight. So um, anyone who fancies staying up late for even more whiskey, Scotch Test Dummies are, are doing a big thing tonight, aren't you? At, yep, 8 o'clock in five hours on our channel, 8 o'clock Central Time, 8 p.m. Central Time, which would be 2 in the morning for you guys, right? Yep. Uh, Dalmore has teamed up with us to do a virtual tasting and a fundraiser for the American Nurses Association. So hopefully bring in a little bit of money and, and help them with some supplies or maybe some something that they may need at this time. Brilliant, brilliant. That's a great thing to do as well. So did I did I see you pulling up a bottle of Dualcus to the camera there as well? Oh yeah, yeah. I thought that's I, before Bart said before I realized he had the twelve, and I know that's so. This is the uh, the state's version of the legacy, that's same right. not non age statement, kind of the entry level. Um, yeah. a great bottle, sub thirty dollars here, um, and I've got a few lined up here we can go through. But I think a shout out though, real quick to Jennifer. Um, I don't know, does she still work there? She does, yeah. 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 And she, she was an opportunity to leave when we visited in person. Yeah, but I think she was the one that was she had kind of seen us, and I think she mentioned us to you to watch those these crazy yanks or something yeah. like that. She said that was actually very close to her wording. It's not even so much of a paraphrase there. <laughs> it, was like, it was very much along the lines of so who wants to go online with a couple of crazy American guys? And of course, myself and Scott were very quick to say yes to that. <laughs> that was before I was even working in an ambassadorial capacity. I was in the sales side at that point. So um, yeah, that was a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, she was awesome. I loved, I was, we were chatting with her uh, early on. Yeah. Oh, she, she might even be watching tonight. I know she's on um, leave next week, but it's not like she's going anywhere. So um, how are things with you guys over in the States? Are you very much on lockdown? You're obviously in two different uh, rooms tonight. Yeah, I keep trying to uh, get too close to Bruno, and he social distances me. He, he stopped by one day just to pick up some samples, and I thought he, he was trying to hug me and stuff. He, I kept I, I was leading him around my kitchen, just trying to stay away from him, and he kept calling me and trying to he get was, close. He was holding, he was holding the bottle, and he was just like, come on, and he wouldn't let me. I'm like, what are you doing? What are you doing? But no, we're, uh, we're, you know, we're pretty much smack dab right in the middle of the states, Wichita, Kansas. Um, we've really, it's been pretty mild here. Um, the state of Kansas is over a thousand positive tests and over a hundred deaths at this point. Wichita, our, our area has only, has seen, I think, single digit. Um, are we double digit deaths now somewhere? It's, it's low compared. Oh, yeah. I think you're single digit on, on, yeah, it was. 
So a few weeks ago, they implemented, it was just a suggestion to do the, um, you know, uh, stay at home orders. Nothing's really on lockdown. A lot of businesses, non-essential businesses and restaurants, they closed. So they got, they got on it pretty early for our area. And I think it really helped. So, and then, and so here, the essential businesses was pretty wide open to the point. Scott knows already where I'm going with this one. So my mom is 77. My stepdad is 87. So I'd been telling him, Hey, I'll go to the store for you. I'll do whatever. And uh, stepdad's, you know, Hey, anything I can do for you. So he was working on a little project while we're doing all our social distancing. I go over in the morning and I figured mom's sleeping in. I'm like, where's mom? She's sleeping in with all this. Well, we have this, I don't, I'm, I'm sure it's not international. It's called Hobby Lobby. And it's like, millions and millions of trinkets and sewing materials or modeling or paints or pencils or knickknacks. It's like germ environment. To the <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, well, you know, your mom went to Hobby Lobby and I, and I'll keep it clean here. I kept it clean with him, but all I said was what? And then I curved everything off. Cause I'm thinking what's mom doing going to the desk store? What the heck? <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm going and shopping for food, and you went to the knickknack store that they can't. There's no way they can get the knickknack store clean. And so, <laughs> the first thing I did was send her a text that would be as if she was my child and probably a teenager. And I had to delete that one before I sent because it. it was like, "What do you think you're doing, going out?" Blah blah. And I was like, "Well, I can't send that one to mom. That won't go over good." So I simply turned it to yikes. What are you going to the knickknack store for? That doesn't seem like the best idea. And he called and was like, Well, there's nobody here. I'm like, Mom, they can't clean that place to the necessary me. And then I called all the siblings so that she would get multiple hits on stay home, stay home. Yeah. So that's kind of what's going on here. Cause I told her, I said, Hey, I have to go to work. Those that don't know, I think a lot of folks on do, but uh, Scott and I are in law enforcement and I can't work from home. I'm out in the field, but I'm, so I told her, let me go get your food and stuff. It's not like I'm not getting exposed every day anyway, but uh, I mean, I'm dropping food off at the front porch and you know, she had a birthday and we're, we're setting a bag, ringing the bell, and then running 10 feet away and waving, and all of a sudden, she's at Hobby Lobby. I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> now, since then, that store's been shut down. So that solved that. Apparently, mom's got an addiction to knickknacks that just even the COVID-19 couldn't stop. So, Did she get what she needed? What was she going for? Did she tell you what she wanted? Yeah, it was sewing supplies because I'm like, while you're in there, don't be picking stuff up. I mean, I'm, you know, it's like, again, it's like the roles reversed and she's suddenly a small child in the aisle at the store. And she's like, I had to get some sewing material. And then I had to kind of, I had to zip it before I was going to get in big trouble. So yeah, I just said, be careful. You're in that, you're like in the risk group. So all right, I am going to move on. I'll let other people talk. I'm going to move to the 14, which is the port cask. And until I found the PX, this was my favorite. So good stuff. Good stuff. I'm still looking away on this legacy here. It's really nice. But so I guess we should probably have some sort of theme. Um, like I was saying, even the fact that we are doing this tonight is an example of the whiskey industry trying to do whatever it can in these challenging times to stay in contact with um, the whiskey community. What's your take on that? How do you think the industry has been doing, Roy? I know you've, we've had a few conversations behind the scenes, but um, I'd be really interested to see, hear your opinions because you guys have been doing this for years with great levels of success. Um, have you seen a pickup in viewers over the last couple of weeks yourself? Um, and what well, and, and our own channels. Well, I mean, yeah, speak, yeah. speaking for speaking for my uh, channel, um, the live streams that go out the V pubs have been very, very well attended recently. Um, the last night's live stream went out, and it was behind the Charlie McLean live stream and the Ralphie live stream. Last night's was the biggest ever, um, and it was Roddy and I, Roddy Graham from Glasgow and I, a fantastic guy, really. 
super knowledgeable guy, but I didn't heavily advertise it beforehand. So there has been a, a build there. The audience is coming and they're enjoying the extra output, let's say. Um, I think that what's happened recently is that it, it doesn't matter what social media feed you switch on. It doesn't matter um, which ch channel you look at on YouTube or whatever. Somebody's doing something. They're all all doing things. Um, and the, the creators, so Scott, Bart, myself, and everybody else out there that we know and work with have become friends, collaborators. We saw this happening years ago where we were all starting to compete for the same viewing minutes. So we tried to be clever and make sure that we didn't schedule live streams at the same time. Uh, we tried to be supportive of each other. And, um, you, you know, once, once, you, once you start to collaborate and once you start to work as a team, what happens there is that there's a bigger value then for the community watching because they're getting more than just kind of a, a singular a singular delivery of content they're getting layers of content they're getting interaction and they're getting exploration and everything that you can achieve when you work together as a team um, in collaboration and i think that that's going to be the big challenge for the industry going forward because there are so many brands out there uh, let's just imagine tomatin you've got kuboken you've got tomatin brands um and you're going to be you're going to be trying to keep your information flow and sharing through these strange and different times, alongside every other brand that makes anything. And what's going to be interesting is to see how these brands, um, because it's an inevitability that you're going to have to say, right, okay, we can't do this. We can't fight for those same minutes. We're going to need to collaborate. The, the biggest event I've ever seen on WhiskeyTube happened on Saturday of last week. 900 and something peak participants in the live, 13, 14,000 views in one week. And that was a product of collaboration. And the reason that that was successful is because the community got a value out of it. They saw the value and they bought into it. And they stayed for the, how long did it go for in the end? Four hours? Just over four hours, yeah. 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 It, it tapered off a little bit in the last hour, but still over 600 views right until the very end, which was more than we could have asked for going into it. Yeah. And, and I have to say, the boys underneath me here, um, Scott, and I don't know which direction, that way for Bart. That way. These guys were, the, they, they, they didn't, they often admit that they didn't realize it at the time but they were one of the trailblazing channels for when it came to collaboration. They were just kind of reaching out with people that they'd connected with and friends and things. And, and they started this thing in motion, this kind of, uh, they, they, built, they built up this crew of collaborators that were all working together and all had a very, very different take on a very similar theme. And we realized very, very quickly there was a huge overlap with our audience so it made sense for us not to, uh, if at all possible, sometimes it's inevitable, but not schedule live streams at the same time, try and come up with concepts that we could share and do together over a, you know, a kind of crossover thing over channels. And the feedback that we got from that was, was pretty powerful. I don't know if uh, Scott and Bart would agree. Definitely. I was replying to uh, comments there, so I came in at the end of that wanting me to agree to something. But I know well, you were talking I, about I was, I was yeah. even trying to get dummy one to answer first. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there was that big value of the live and, and all that. But <laughs> Snell! <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I, th I think I remember the first ever roundtable event that went out. I think it was on your, yeah. your channel as well. And it was all the kind of YouTube creators getting together and just having a hangout and a nice time. And I remember that getting a very positive response from the community as well. I mean, we had a nice time, but we we're going to have a nice time in a private video chat. What we were concerned about is, is would that bring value to the community? Um, and it did. And we got really, really quite good feedback. Now, in time, we realized that there wasn't a lot of value to continually appear on everybody else's channel all the time. Um, but we realized um, the power of collaboration way back at the beginning. Yeah, I, I agree. So, and I know um, Ben Marnock commented earlier, we were talking about the live stream, the first live stream that we did when Scott and Scott joined us. Um, 
And Ben remembered watching that as well as one of his first. But Roy, you were also tuning into that one. Yes. So we're going back to it must have been early 2017. Was it Scott Adamson? Was it was it 2017? January 2017. Aquavita existed, but there was no content on the channel. It was an Instagram channel, it was a website with some nonsense written on it and things. And there was this desire. Um, to move into video because I knew some of the things I wanted to share just demanded video. It was going to have to be video. And I remember tuning into that live stream and I'd been a fan of Scottish Test Dummies of Scott and Bart for some time. And I watched that live stream and I was really excited about it because it was on a, it was on a, my time zone. <laughs> a lot of your streams at the time would have been in, in the early hours of the morning for me. Uh, so that was going out a wee bit earlier. And uh, Scott Fraser and Scott Adamson were tuning in and they were very relaxed, very laid back. The questions that were being asked were, were uh, sometimes a little bit tricky, a little bit challenging, and they answered them very honestly in a very candid um, and endearing way, I have to say. And there was a lot of comedy permitted in that. You'll remember the discussions about tea bags and all <laughs> sorts of things going on. And I, I asked, I asked a, a question in that stream, but I wasn't Aquavite. I was ROI in that stream. Just didn't. And Scott read it out. And I remember getting that, that stab of excitement when that happened. And I thought, wait a, wait a minute. They, I, I've just been able to deliver my question directly to the two Scots via a channel I've been watching that I'm a fan of for, for a long time now. I'm part of this. It was electrifying. And I thought, these guys are killing it. These guys are, and I think it was an inspiration that I've later discovered it was inspiration through Bart's friends in the gaming, board gaming world and things. And there was this drive from Scott and Bart to kind of get the live streams under their belt and underway because there is a learning curve, a tech learning curve, of course. But when they started to do that, I thought, this is going to bring the community together. This stuff is going to energize everybody and connect people because I'd been trying to do that in my day job for years and it's a really difficult thing to do and the thing that's missing in my day job is passion most people do their day job just because they need to earn money and the whiskey community the passion is already there all you need is to put in place the mechanisms to connect people and that's what Scott and Bart were doing and I was like damn it I, I I need to be involved in this. I want this is the community I want to be involved in. <laughs> and and it was it was actually I later spoke to Scott Bruno about that. And he and he was like, you know, yeah, you're right, but we had no idea that that's what we were doing. They had no idea the, the catalytic catalytic effect that they were going to have in the community doing that. Yeah. Am I right, Scott Bruno? Uh, I yeah, I agree. Um I mean, we Bart knew with his board games that they'd been live streaming doing those for a while. And so we we're like, we want to bring, that was the next step for us bringing those in. And there was a little bit of a learning curve and just trying to figure out how to do it um, at the time and invite people in, you know, link it to the channel and do all that. And really we were going and, and, you know, we're watching these other YouTube channels and we're bringing them in as well. And it just, it just it's a snowball effect. It just, you know, we had to, we'd, we'd hook up with people. We had a lot of people would have questions and they're, you know, they're wanting to do it. They're wanting to try it. How do you do it? And I, you know, we'd hook up with them and say, step A, B, C, to walk them through the process and show them how to do the live streams themselves. And uh, yeah, it just blew up. Yeah. And our whole deal has always been, um, even with, with Scott and I, with Bruno and I sitting here is it's two buddies enjoying whiskey and so so right off the bat we can't go wrong because i always have fun when i'm hanging out with, with bruno and then you add in whiskey and we knew it would translate through um and then what was real interesting was the the information we got back because a lot of people um would say hey i'll buy something and I'll wait and see when you're going to, or they'll know we're going to review it and they would go buy it. And then they would wait and watch it while they shared it with us. So it was, it was a virtual dram that they were in control of. And, uh, and so when we started getting those comments, we knew that what we were trying to do was translating. Cause when we started, we were like, 
quite honestly, if I'm hanging out with you and I got a, a reason to buy whiskey and hang out with my buddy and 14 people watch, we were going to call that a win. So, and you know, so it's been uh, awesome. Two things. One, Bart, you said you always have fun when you're drinking. There's been a couple of times where I had to bring you around. You were not, you were like in the depths of despair a couple of times after work. And I had to be like, come on, this is why we train. Reach down there deep, grab that fun and bring it to the surface. Yeah. Yeah. You come home from like a double shooting and he's like, let's get fun now. Come on. Now. Like, huh? Yeah. Then he'd be like, come on, shake it off, shake it off. And I'd be like, all right. And he'd throw some water in my face when I wasn't expecting it. I'd be like, what are you doing? But, so. uh, and then number two, David Evans says, we all love a shout out. Can the dummies give a shout out to my son, Benji Evans? He has a better nose than me and picks out some interesting things I would never get. And he's only five years old, he says. Oh, wow. <laughs> he's five. I'm going to yell out, Benji, you got to test it. <laughs> he's not five. Benji, I wonder how old he actually is. I'm sure uh, I'm sure David will let us know. I'm going into the look at this Kuboken that's almost down here. That's almost that's a heel sleigh almost. That is getting low. That is getting low. Now I just actually on my end it just popped up saying that uh StreamYard's having difficulty streaming to Facebook Live at the moment. It seems to have come back. I've just seen Chris, you're in the chat, mate. Could you pop over to Facebook and uh see if it's all going well again? And uh, just give me a text to let me know. That's not just someone random. Chris is my colleague, so that's why I've asked him. But uh, I think if, if you guys are saying that the, the reason you started doing the live streams was an excuse to buy a bottle, looking behind you, I would say that you've been relatively successful in that regard. Those those collections are getting outlandish behind you now. Yeah, yeah. My, my wife can hear me, but I'll say whenever I'm buying an expensive bottle, I usually say it's for the show. It's for the yeah. show. Yeah. <laughs> I tell my wife this was only like five hundred bucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, undersell it. Undersell it. That's right. That's right. So David Evans says his son is nine, so he's older than I than than what I said. So that's still young, young for the whiskey nose. He's got a good nose. What? Okay, so uh, Bart, you mentioned the Kubokan. That's what you're drinking, Scott. When are the new Kubokans coming to the states? That is a very, very good question. And that is a question that you need to ask uh, Scott Fraser um, yeah. more than myself. Um, he looks after the States. So we're hoping to get them out there. I think the one of the issues has been that with the creations, the, the run is quite limited. So I think even on the first run that we might not have even done the 750 mil bottles, I think we've only done the 700 mil. Um, I will try and sort you guys out personally, but um, because I think you'd enjoy them. And it's, it's part of the conversation that we had back in 2017 about what the future of that brand was going to hold and what it was going to morph into. So there's some interesting stuff for you for you to taste there now. But going back to that and that first live stream, what I was curious about, because it's something that I've not really heard you talking about a lot online, and maybe you have, and maybe I've missed it along the way, but what was your sort of interest in whiskey before you started Scotch Test Dummies? Where did where did that come from? How did that grow? And how did you decide to, even before the live videos, to start doing the recorded videos and set up the channel? So my interest is, is easy. I love history, all kinds of history. But I was watching the History Channel. I think I'd come home from work, just had the History Channel on. And they actually had a show or two um, that was the history of scotch. And then they had one that was the history of bourbon and they were really well done documentaries. And it really sparked my interest in, you know, how they're capturing, you know, basically a moment in time in a barrel translated into a bottle. And I was like, wow. Um, and then I talked to Scott and, and we got a group of, law enforcement guys together because I'd heard there was a liquor store that would do whiskey tastings. And we, I set one up and we had 10 guys come over and everybody pitched in. And, and, uh, the very first one, they just, uh, the guy that came in just did the regions and, uh, we did three or four of those. Is that right, Bruno? 
Scott Bruno? Uh, oh. Yeah, I'm thinking. Of, yeah. Yeah. And then, and then off we were. And, uh, you know, uh, early on, some folks know this. I, I had a log of wool in 16 and I was like, ugh, ugh, it's too peaty. I was like, what is this? I didn't even know Petey. I was like, this is like an ashtray, and now I'm the Pete head. So that's been an interesting, you know, you know, as my palate's grown and, and changed. Yeah. I would say, so my wife was on a girl's cruise, uh, 07, 08. I've, I, so I've only really been into whiskey for about 13 years now. But she was on a girl's cruise, and she came home all excited. And she said, I got your dad a big bottle of scotch. It was, you know, cheap on the ship. And I said, uh, well, that's fine. But I said, my dad doesn't drink scotch. And so she said, well, I guess that's more for you then, because I bought you one too. And I, <laughs> I'm like, I don't drink scotch. She goes, you don't? Like, wh when have you ever seen me sitting around sipping on whiskey? <laughs> I, go, well, from what I understand it's kind of nasty stuff. Yeah, he usually had drinks with umbrellas. And yeah. <laughs> well, I, you know, I probably drank whiskey and Cokes, you know, occasionally, sure. and, you know, Bud Light, Corona, Coors Light, stuff like that. And it was Johnny Walker Black, what she bought. And so I thought, well, since she bought it, you know, I'll be nice. I'll try it. And I knew you either drank it neat, you know, or on the rocks or with water. So at first, you know, I was probably, you know, this much whiskey and this much water <laughs> and ice. And uh, I was like. Well, that's not too bad, actually. I kind of liked it. So over time, it just kind of, you know, it came down to where it's more whiskey, less water. Uh, Bart and I were working together uh, 2000 and, well, we've worked together for years, but we were yeah. overlapping shifts and working side by side back in 2011, 12, and 13. And we'd, we'd been talking about whiskey, YouTube, Bart had watched the, the shows. He was getting in, he was drinking some whiskey. I was drinking some whiskey. We, he was he was doing board game reviews on YouTube, so he knew that aspect of it. We were watching some some whiskey reviewers on, and we were literally like, you know, we could do that and bring our banter, our our fun, and an entertainment to whiskey reviews instead of just the monotone, in depth review that might put you to. <laughs> You know, so that really, literally that's how we got started. Finally, 2013, we're like, hey, let's, let's try it. Let's let's crank this out. And uh, here we are. Yeah. Now, that wasn't there was one solid star at the point. Ralphie was huge even then, obviously. But what and we we had watched him. But there were a few folks that were like chiming in. And I was like what is this? I mean, I could, uh, Ralphie was all, was good as soon as I started watching, but there were a few folks. I was like, what is this guy doing? I don't even understand what he, you know, he wasn't even communicating well. So that was some of the, the impetus for, of an idea. And I, and I, I think we were a little slow growing at first um, people and, and the, we started green though too. I mean, we were new, to whiskey and, and Roy has pointed out he watched because we were really kind of documenting our our journey you know into the whiskey and, and here was these these guys with these fresh new palettes right and anything over 46 percent ABV to me was Ooh. really strong Ooh. you know yeah <laughs> he needed definitely needed water on this one because it's 46 percent and that was definitely part of our idea too, is that who are we? We're just a couple dummies. And Scott came up with the final full name and it was like, jump in for the journey. Now yeah. I got a question for Roy because uh, we, you know, Roy's wheelie bin stuff. I Did you plan that out or was that one of those happy accidents? Cause that is awesome. Uh, so the first, um, when I started the channel, exactly as Scott said, I didn't want to just bring more of the same. I didn't want to be another reviewer that kind of shared an experience with a whiskey, um, gave it a score and please subscribe, that kind of thing. I, I knew that I wanted to bring something else. I wanted to bring other things. And I, I knew that it, it had to be about the community. It had to be interactive. And I knew that, um, 
you know, it's funny because I loved watching you guys because of the fun that you were having, because of the buddy dynamic. But I also loved watching your journey and I watched the naivety of some of the things that you would say, the pronunciations, the <laughs> concepts that you were making assumptions and just, you know, honing in on it, but getting it just a, a little bit off centered, let's say, just understanding some of it, but not all. And I thought, wow, if there was somebody out there that could share the basic concepts so that people like this, as they go along their journey, can build from a, a much kind of deeper understanding about some very, very basic things about, I'm obviously speaking about Scotch whiskey in general. Um, and I knew that that's kind of what I wanted to be about then. And, but I still kind of knew that some form of reviewing would, would need to be a factor of the channel. There would have to be editorial opinion. You would have to be committing your colors or you would have to be sharing valuable opinions with people. And one day I'm sitting there with a, a box full of empties, throwing them away, which was always a heartbreaking experience for me. It was literally like saying goodbye to old friends. Anybody that enjoys whiskey will know exactly what I'm talking about. And I'm like, you know what? I've just started this, this channel. I'm looking for content. I've got a basket full of content here. I'm going to film my experience with this entire bottle and try and share a basic concept of a score, but also that really important thing is whether I would replace it or not. And I, I filmed it and I edited it and I sent it to my brother. And my brother phoned me back and said, you need to put that out. That's fantastic. He said, that's so funny as an idea. He said, and yet I came away thinking there's another two or three bottles that I want to buy. I'm talking to my brother. So the, the first recycled review went out. And I remember Vin from No Nonsense Whiskey was... He was, I always say he's, he was my 11th subscriber, and I'm not exactly sure that that's what it was, but it was really, that's how early it was. It was barely into double digits subscribers. And Vin came on board and left a comment, and it was one of the first comments that I got, and he said, that's a really interesting way to review whiskey. I look forward to seeing where it goes. Um, and and that's, that's kind of where that started from. And once you've made one and people connect with it, then you have to make another, and then it becomes a thing. And uh, and now, yeah, the wheelie bin. That, that's, yeah, it's, even, it's even been spoofed by somebody I know. Well, I was EJ Brown in the comments had just mentioned that he'd caught that that Scott parody <laughs> video recently of recycled reviews, and I, and I shared that on my Patreon recently, and I and I basically shared it because when I'm feeling a bit down in the dumps and wondering what all this YouTube content creation is all about, and I watched that video, and it's a tonic, an absolute tonic. Yeah. And I and I thanked Scott at the time for making that um because I was I was about six, seven, eight hundred subscribers. I was much, much smaller. And and I got a big lift in subscribers. I got 80, 90 subscribers over a weekend when Scott released that. And I thanked him. Um because I naively thought that he'd done it to be <laughs> to be kind. And he said, No, I just wanted to have fun. <laughs> I didn't even consider that you'd get any subscribers out of it. I remember um, when Scott first posted that and I hadn't I don't know if I'd seen one of your recycled reviews at the time so I'm watching this going what, what why is he why is he drinking so much beside his bin <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'm genuinely watching this going oh he's he's really not in a good way here I hope I <laughs> it was alive or not and then there was a mention of Roy and I, I went and watched it and I was like that and it was something that's just come up in the, the feed there. The recycled reviews are genius. They are an incredible way. It's, it's some, something you've mentioned to me, Roy, in the passing is that it's about adding value. And there's a lot of channels out there doing reviews and doing them very well. Scotch Test Dummies is a case in point of doing whiskey reviews very well. And I think like you, I've enjoyed watching along and watching that whiskey journey because it's something that you don't often see. Um, you sometimes catch a glimpse of a friend who's had their first bottle and then they're making a recommendation to you, but you don't get to see that bottle by bottle. So that's mm. been nice to see. But I think what you, the point you made, Roy, was that Aquavita was never meant to be a channel about reviews, but you found a very interesting way about bringing your approach, your evangelism um, approach to whiskey into reviewing yeah yeah and i mean it's nice i knew that i knew that i enjoyed listening to 
tasting notes and in-depth reviews. But really, honestly speaking, only when it was a whiskey I was very interested in. Um, and if I heard a new whiskey that I'd never heard of before, I wasn't going to go out and buy it simply because it tasted of lemon rind and creme brulee. <laughs> so I always felt like the, the, the tasting notes were a nice way for people to articulate what they were experiencing. But I felt like, certainly back in those days, I felt like that, that I had to find another way to explain why I wanted that whiskey back in the cabinet again. And that ended up being uh, recycled reviews. The problem with recycled reviews are that I, I'd kind of, I've put this, I've got this ball and chain now where it needs to be 15 bottles, right? So I have to wait until there's 15 bottles that's close to being finished before I can make a video. And then I have to wait for Scottish weather being kind enough to me so that I can stand outside and, and do it. I mean, I can film in rain, and as I've proved in the past. I'm desperate to do one in snow, but there was no snow this year. Um, the wind is always going to be the challenge. The wind is the problem. Well, that was the one that I that I spoofed was probably your second or third one because you went out there and you started to shoot it. And then you go, whoo, it's chilly. Then you left and you come back with a coat on. That's you know, right. Like, oh, why would he even have the first part in there? Just start filming over with the coat. So at the beginning of mine, I'm out there and I go, oh, man, it's kind of cold out here. So I disappear oh, and come back. Well, with, but with the, the, the reason is, is I'm trying to I'm trying to bring that elemental thing in the climate. The yeah. conditions, the environment, that kind of thing. So, so yeah, yeah, but you spotted that straight away and went, <laughs> look well, at this. Dummy, dummy One did the same thing. He started outside the wheelie bin and he ended inside the wheelie <laughs> bin. <laughs> <laughs> well, and Graham, Graham Frazier's asking, there was, there, and at first there was a couple comments that come in that people thought I was actually drinking whiskey. Um, it may have been um, Coca Cola One <laughs> was the dark colored ones, and then Ginger Ale was the lighter colored. I actually used two, so it looked like you know uh, a bourbon cask, and then uh, or something. The sherry caskings and the Elijah Craig Barrel Proof was the Coca Cola One. So yeah, it was not actually right there. do what Scott? That's production value right there. Yep. Yes, no and whiskeys, the no whiskeys were harmed in Scott's uh, video. The carbonated beverages do lead to some belching. Uh, <laughs> Which so the, the the belch that you let out, the one of the last belches that you let out, I recorded and I had it as my text message notification for, <laughs> for quite a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Bart does yeah. not like belching. Bart is really offended by a belch. That's why I got to let one go every once in a oh, while. Oh, it's terrible. I, I totally get why, why people don't like when they can hear some of the swishing noises. I get it. The swishing doesn't bother me. The 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 Bruno throwing up in his mouth gets me. <laughs> <laughs> so you've not got that as a ringtone, no? Oh, no. <laughs> Matter of fact, it's so bad that he knows, uh, Bruno knows he can get me with it. And now my son, who's 13, has figured it out. I'm like, quit it. Stop it. But that's that's something that we know about you. Too. And when, when we talk about reviewing whiskey and adding value, that's something that you guys do. Because there's, there's clearly this character that exists in the rest of your life happening. I can imagine you guys in a squad car or in an office or wherever. And, and Bruno or Scott you know, burps, and you're just like, oh, God, and you're just giving them a hard time. We know that that's part of your kind of dynamic, and, and it's kind of what we come to start to enjoy, all the little quirks. And it's that idea of community, because this culture builds around that. The, the, the audience, the people watching, tap into that and understand it and start to reference it and have fun with it as well. Well, and um, you're spot on, because something that, that I learned long ago is that it's those quirks, whether it's your spouse, your kids, your buddy, whatever, that actually make them unique in who they are. And then, now, Scott, you can't listen to this. Then you almost start to appreciate those little quirks. <laughs> so, but, uh, but yes, yeah, I mean, and that's definitely it. I mean, um, Scott and I riding around in a patrol car together takes me back to when I was a rookie. So when we were both sergeants or supervisors together, we would go for coffee and that coffee would last a couple hours until the point we got in trouble for spending too much time together. So, but uh, yeah. 
That happened. It was, a, it was a it was a long, long time before it came out that you guys were cops, right? Yeah, we wanted to keep that kind of on the uh, on the down low. Just, I mean, we, until until we got closer to retirement age, basically. Well, and our early on, so we started in 2013, and was it 2017? We got a new chief of police. The old the old chief of police was very anti any social media type presence. Uh, if you even wanted to post uh, your picture on Facebook, you had to get his permission. Right. Yeah. If you were there was we had a brand new rookie kid and he had a he put his family up with him at his academy graduation. So he's brand new and he's in uniform and they were wondering if he should be in trouble. I'm like, what are you guys doing that? I mean, he's proud. His family's with him. I mean, why would he be in trouble? I mean, it was weird. But yeah, and then so the new chief came in. He's an, he's a lot more social media friendly. And then we had a close uh, a buddy that we worked with, a detective last year. Matt Young got um, pancreatic cancer stage four, and uh, we did a fundraiser for him. And during that fundraiser is really when we then kind of put out, hey, we're you know we're law enforcement. Uh, Matt was a detective or is a detective with the police department at the time, and yeah. So it, it also helps too. Our chief is Scottish second generation and he plays the bagpipes. So has he been a guest yet? Say again, no, he hasn't. You know, we should get him on. He loves doing stuff like jumping on trampolines. I want him to jump on the trampoline while playing the bagpipes. <laughs> <laughs> Just make sure he's not wearing a kilt at the time. There you go. That's it. I've got a comment coming in, Scott and Bart from Highlander 999. See if you can guess. Well, I guess... It's 999 is our equivalent of 911, right? And he's saying, um, Scotch Test Dummies, hello from a fellow cop in Scotland. Hello, Highlander 999. Hello. So, Roy, what was what was your sort of background in whiskey before, yeah. before Scotch okay. Test Dummies? I mean, there, are, there are obviously going to be people tuning in that's, that's watched me on my channel that have heard this story, but I'll nevertheless share it. Um, you know, the company I'm working for now, well, up until the end of this month, uh, ends at the end of this month, but I've been working for them since 1999, so 21 years. Italian company, head offices in Milan. A guy comes over from Rome, a Rome office. What you What was you, you holding up there? The PX? Um, PX. PX. Is it PX time? Okay. I'm cracking, I'm cracking my bottle. My last Is this bottle. what you got when you were over? I, brought, I bought two when I was over there. One went away pretty quick, and this one's still been sitting in the field. <laughs> Um, I know that Gregor McQueen in the chat is wincing at us talking about how good a whiskey this is yeah. because it's, it's it's dampening his supply and uh, keeping the price going up. So As soon as Roy gets done, though, and we move into this, if we're going to talk about this PX, is, uh, Scott, I want you to kind of go through because you've had, you're on your third or fourth cast now in the distillery in the visitor center. I want you to walk us through kind of the selection process, how you choose that next cask. So as soon as Roy's finishes up. Uh, yeah, so the head office is Milan, and um, the guy comes over. His name's Luca. Great guy, comes over from Rome, and he lands um, for, a, for an event that was being held in Scotland, and I was his kind of chauffeur, host, bag carrier. You know, I was just looking after him while he was in Scotland. But when he arrived, he kind of he's, – he's at the airport, and he said, Hey, Roy – during my stay in Scotland, he said, I need to visit a distillery. Can you arrange for me? He said, would be fantastic. I love whiskey. And I said, Luca, I'm really sorry. Um, you've asked the wrong guy. I, I know nothing about whiskey. I don't like whiskey. And I'll never, ever forget. This was 2005. I'll never forget his reaction. He just kind of took a step back. He was shocked. And he looked at me and he said, you live in the country that makes the best spirit in the world and you choose to know nothing about it. Good. And he does this. <laughs> and I'm just like, okay, okay, I've made a blunder here. You know, this is like this alpha male Italian. He's into his wine. He's al fresco dining. He's fine foods, everything. He's coming over here to engage with something that we make here. And I can't even give him his first step. Now, 2005 was the start of kind of Google and every, and I remember going back and searching on the web and I found uh, a distillery to take him to a visitor center. And I went back to him that evening and I said, Luca, it's all arranged. 
I've found a distillery to take you to on Wednesday before your flight home. We can go and visit a distillery. Eh, hey, fantastic, he says. Which distillery? And I said, oh, it's just a really small distillery near Glasgow called Glengoyne. Ah, Glengoyne, fantastic. It's his favourite distillery. Mm. Immediately, he's just lit up. He's just so, so, so happy. And we went to Glengoyne. We did the standard kind of tour. And he's walking around the place asking questions that clearly told me that he knew what he was talking about, that he loved the whiskey. He was deeply passionate about it. And he was rendered like a kid in a, in a sweet shop. He was just walking around like a happy, happy guy. And I remember going around and enjoying the tour. And I remember I was a chauffeur that day as well. I was driving. I remember being in the tasting room after the tour. And we were just kind of hanging around. I remember just kind of propped up against a barrel with a dram in hand. I could only just have a sip. And I remember that sip to this day. And I realized that this is not the whiskey that I had had too much of when I was younger. I realized it was something completely different. And it was consumed in a completely different way from the way I'd understood that whiskey was consumed, you know, drink as opposed to taste. So I kind of left that tour straight through the shop picked up the water jug, the glass, a bottle of Glengoyne, 10 year old, the whole shooting match and brought it home. And I remember my wife's reaction looking at me and going, what, whiskey? Like that. <laughs> and that, that was 2005. And ever since then, every time I meet Luca or speak to Luca, I have a quiet moment with him and thank him for changing um, my life trajectory, I suppose. That's how it kind of all started. And I was sharing whiskey for a few years. Um, but it was a, it was an Isla whiskey that actually made me a, a passionate geek a few years after that. But that's how it started. That that seems very similar to myself in that, and, and I don't know if you felt this, but living in Scotland, the country of distilleries, I almost took them for granted before I started working at Tomatin and actually getting an understanding of what went into making the liquid, the the craft, how people enjoyed it. I mean, a good example is. We're on this lockdown right now and we're only allowed out for one piece of exercise a day. And this week I've been on annual leave. So every day I've been taking my wee son out for a walk. He's 18 months old. So pop him in the pram and go for a walk. And within 10 minutes of leaving my front door, I'm walking down the hill at Dalmore Distillery. And that's just something that before I got into whiskey, I would have taken for granted. Mm. But now when I'm walking down that hill, I'm I'm reminded by the amount of people who would have otherwise have been traveling halfway around the world to be there, to go and pay, to go and see what I can walk past every day. And I think living around these distilleries, it's only once you actually spend a bit of time um, engaging with the liquid and the people that make it that you actually get the appreciation for what it is that maybe people in other countries get from just having the bottles on the shelves. Absolutely, absolutely, and I think that when you when you are brought up in an environment where there are distilleries and whiskey bottling plants and warehouses and everything everywhere, you just assume that that's life for everyone. You don't actually realise that it's um, it's a it's a it's a much but much bigger deal than that. Yeah, uh, and yeah, it took it took an Italian to educate me as to mm. what existed inside my own country. The Italians were one of the original single malt drinkers, really, weren't they? Absolutely, at the hands of people like uh, Samaroli. Yeah. They they knew back in the 50s and 60s what we had going on here. And we, <laughs> we didn't. We were only learning in the last 20 or so years. They're a little bit like Gregor is in the chat tonight. Just don't talk about it. Don't tell anybody. Let's keep it for Italy. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Perhaps you're right. Perhaps you're right. There might have been some of that going on. Don't tell yeah. the world. So that is the original PX that we even had in our in our blind tasting that won. So this was bottled um, the second of August, twenty eighteen, and uh, cask number on it. The cask number is I think that's three nine nine one three. Either a 399 or a 34913, but it was four. Okay, three four. Because it was distilled on the uh January 18th, 2002. But when I was there, which is nice, I also picked up one of the 1990s. And so I can see the beautiful day that we were there. 
which was five, or you would say 22, the 22nd day, 519. So beautiful, beautiful. And that was cast number 16366. So yeah. my, my original bottle, or my bottle, first bottle from the distillery has been gone for a while. This one's been sitting here sealed. I've cracked it. I've poured Ooh. it. I can smell it, and I'm just salivating, just mm -hmm. waiting to go into it. I can. It's just. Do what, Scott? What cask number do you have there? Uh, three, four, eight, six, seven. Okay, so I think what's going on there is um, the one that Bart has was the original PX cask. Mm -hmm. uh, We've got is actually a earlier distillation date. We're on the 30th of um, November 2001 with our casks. Yep. But I've yep. got a different cask number from you um, because my bottle was bottled on the 14th of October last year. So since you guys were at the distillery last year, we've moved on to another cask. Mm -hmm. And to touch on what you asked earlier on about how do we pick these casks, it's very simple that Graham Munson picks these casks. You know, he talked about on our um, uh, chat a couple of weeks ago about excellent, chat. excellent. Sorry, excellent chat. If if anybody wants to see some real insider information delivered in a very candid and endearing way, go back and watch that. That was only your second ever live stream, I think, Scott, just a couple of weeks ago with Graham Munson. That's right. E excellent. Sorry. It was brilliant as well because very much like tonight, the first one we did was myself and Scott Fraser very much going back and forth talking about whiskies. Um, and then the, the following week, I got to ask Graham a couple of questions and sit back and have a whiskey and listen to him just talk about whiskey. And, and like you say, in a very open way, you know, I think sometimes people in these positions have very polished responses that toe a line of sorts, but Graham was just answering from his experiences, which was brilliant to see. Yeah. Um, but what he pointed out in that is that now when we're doing our bottlings or our limited releases, he's actually in the chat and he's just uh, mentioned that it's a tough job that he's got. <laughs> so... Um, when we're doing our limited releases, it goes few, through a few pairs of hands and a, a few noses and tastes. But with the visitor center casks, it's very much been Graham all the way. Um, and on, in particular, the PX cask is the one that we find ourselves replacing the most often now. Um, <laughs> we now have a parcel of sister casks. So, um, Scott, Graham, you're on. Graham's in the chat. We're going to be really annoyed, Scott with you and Graham, if if that means that because you're replacing it most more often that the price starts to creep up and up and up? Well, the price has gone up, but I'll tell you why. Not because we're replacing it more often, because it's a lot older than when we first started doing this. You know, when we first started bottling these casks, they were maybe um, 16 years old. Now they're getting up to 17, 18, 19 years old. So it's more a reflection of where that sits alongside the other products in our range. Yeah. But what we would rather do is have that liquid at a slightly higher price than a liquid that's not as good and doesn't live up to the expectations people have coming to the distillery after having heard about us talking about it. Um, so rather than chopping and changing and going to another young, younger parcel, <laughs> Graham's saying there it's too cheap anyway. Um, <laughs> rather than talking about another parcel, a, a younger parcel of stock, we're picking them from these sister casks. So Scott's got three, four, eight, six, seven. I've got three, four, eight, six, nine. It's a sister cask in that series. Um, but yeah, even, even when you look at that, that's a, what are we looking at here? I'm looking at an 18 year old single cask only available at the distillery and it's around about 120 pounds yeah um that's not a bad price i didn't realize graham was tuning in but I, I honestly i have to tell you this is i mean one of the best whiskeys i've ever had mm -hmm. i absolutely love it i mean there's I, I don't know what compares to it honestly the the px influence the richness the 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 depth of the caramels and the the dark fruits the finish of it it just lingers and keeps going you have a sip of this and that's all you need mm -hmm. 
When I yep. picked up the 1990, which I'm also sampling here, which has these tropical fruit notes and things, and, and it, it, it is more expensive. Scott was like, what are you doing? Because he was doubling down. He was buying two PX. Yeah. And he I was already telling me, you know, we, 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 who knows when we're getting back, maybe you should buy three PX. I think he wanted backups for himself personally. So, but I mean, yeah, and I'm like, well, I wanted to grab this 1990 while we're here as well, because I enjoyed it. But I mean, that even being said, I mean, you're not lying. That that PX is, you know, I mean, yeah, it's Schnell. I, I mean, I love I love sherry um sherry scotch, sherry finished, sherry matured, sh exclusive sherry. Uh, even when I had this, and even now, and if I remember right, these are done about 10 years in an ex bourbon cask. And then the original one we had was 10 years ex bourbon. And then the, the following six years was in the PX cask. Uh, I, I mean, it, so the 18 year still is about the same 10 years in the ex bourbon and eight in the PX. I would need to double check, um, but it's not far off that. It's one of these ridiculously long finishes that we do at Tomato. I would say it's probably 12 and 6 or something to that effect, um, if I'm remembering rightly. Um, but it's just part of the reason that this is such a great liquid. You get a lot of the flavors from the PX cask in a one, two year finish, but it's, I think the difference is the integration this has with the liquid, and that only comes with a long finish. And us putting it into the 16 blind sherry shootout. I mean, uh, cause we do that double blind. So, um, yep. you know, I pay attention when Scott and I are both picking the same thing, whatever it is we're doing. Um, it's so clear how something ends up standing above something else. But we, I mean, that was 16 bottles blind. We had Glendronics in there. We had McAllen's in there. We had Glen Goins, Tam Dews. Mm -hmm. uh, Glenn Farkless, we had cast strengths and everything. It was really probably the toughest one to get being a distillery only bottling, but we thought let's throw it in there just to see how it does. Mm -hmm. I knew it was good. I really, I didn't, I didn't think it would win though. Um, blind. I kind of just some of those, uh, those heavier names, you know, you think of a Glendronic, you know, 18 Allardyce and you're thinking, Oh yeah, that's the, that's the Sherry bomb there. And then blind. Yeah, both of us out of 16 bottles choose that one. And it was just amazing. It still is excellent bottles. And that's why we love blind tasting. I mean, we're we're yeah. double blind. Um, heck, half the time now, Scott sets them up. I don't even know what's in there. I don't even have a clue of what the 16. I might know two or three of them. But uh, and just coming what? to them, coming to them clean. And uh, yeah, that's that's definitely I love it. Yeah. Roy is sitting up there and he's like, that's ah, not even that good of a whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, I, have to say, I genuinely think I genuinely think that this um if you love if you love sweet and rich sherry cask whiskey, this is virtually un unbeatable for its style. It's very I said to Scott Adamson recently when we were sipping it together, I don't think we were live on air, but I said this would be amazing on ice cream. It's re it's really one of those you could pour a glass of this. And it could this this whiskey will last you the whole night, Scott. You hit the nail on the head when you talked about one sip. The finish lasts forever. It co is completely palate coating. I actually think that Scott Scott Bruno would love a bottle of PX Sherry, a genuine just bottle of just sipping a bottle of PX Sherry. It, it's it's a really nice drink in its own right. This is very very cask forward. I don't think there's a lot of tomatin in this. It's not a great tomatin but it's an amazing whiskey. And Graham Younson actually points out, Bart, that 1990 bottle that you have, which I think is a bourbon cask, right? Mm -hmm. That was actually distilled, uh, I think Graham says, on the day, or bottled on the day that he joined the distillery. He said it was distilled on the day that he started in the industry. In the industry, ah, yes, okay. So maybe that's more of a sentimental pick than from nose and taste, but um, when you start to get to tomatoes in their late 20s, it's just ludicrously good tropical juice anyway. Yeah, so I have to say, in Bart's defense, I tried that bourbon cask the day that we bottled it, and bear in mind, we could, I, could, I was the driver, I could only have a tiny sip, and it was beautiful whiskey, absolutely gorgeous. 
it was it was expensive. It's that's quite a, a mature whiskey. It was about twenty eight years old or something. Or yeah, well, no. I mean, it's last year, twenty nine years old. Um, yep. it, it was a pricey whiskey, and I remember trying it. it was It was very very good. Yeah, and then we went from the distillery over to Ballandalic and had an incredible experience there. It was was it was it and Moors we were drinking there after the tour. Oh my god, that was that, that, those were just. I mean, that was from the the family estate's own selection, right? Their own casks. Yeah. Um, but that the, the, I think the amazing thing about that day was the contrast of coming from what was once Scotland's biggest producing malt distillery at Tamatin. And seeing the scale of it, I mean, even even if you're not producing to those levels now, you're still producing what, five or six million liters. I don't know what you do at Tomatin about about two now. Um, we we the capacity is five million liters, um, but we work a four and a half day week. Right. We only okay. use ten. Okay. So we do about two million liters. But to your point there, uh, I was on the twelve hours of boom just shortly after the guys had been over to Scotland and asked them um, what was, how did that fit with their expectations? Did it meet them? Did it change them? And you guys both mentioned as well that you just didn't appreciate the, the scale of what the Tomatin site was before that. You'd only seen us in a boardroom in a small visitor centre and then you show up to what was once the biggest distillery in Scotland. It's it's a big place. Yes. And we, we got the experience of Dunnage uh, for the very first time, I, I could, you know, it, it was the smell of, of, of old wood and dirt and, and what's so weird to describe it is seeing cobwebs. And I mean, yeah. it, it's that dunnage. And when we both got home, we were about, we were both like, we now know what dunnage even tastes like. Yeah. Yeah. And then the contrast of coming from that huge, well-established, long-established, historic distillery, really, in Tamatin, going to this brand new, uh, uh, you know, the, the opposite end, in terms of scale, the opposite end at Ballandalich. Um, really nice, wonderful hospitality we got there. Um, we got we got to taste a new make on-site. They don't let their new make off-site at all. But it's one of these really, really fantastic examples of, of when you want to show somebody the the block stages of how to how to make whiskey. Where to Matin is literally you're going from building to building and you don't know where you are suddenly. You, you if you don't know the site, you're confused. Yeah. Ballandalich is this linear ex experience. So they, they've got they've got milling, mashing, fermentation, distillation, all in one big long line. Yeah. About and you can see one end from the other. Yes, absolutely. And, and it's on a scale that's suddenly manageable to, to yeah. To, to picture, to imagine if you're just coming into whiskey and you want to know how it's made. So that um, was a very, that, that reminds me of my first day back at Tomatin when Graham took me out on tour of the distillery. And we'd gone through the still house, we'd gone through the cooperage and we come outside and I'm like, how did we end up here? You know, that we went in there and now this is here. It's it, like you say, if you do not know the site, you you will get lost. Whereas at Ballandale, you, you're, one side to the other, you can see the whole process in front of you. Absolutely. And then we go through and uh, the tour is over. And I, I think I, I, we maybe share a similar thought. We we had the Numic spirit, which was a lovely spirit. Um, I, th I think it's, it's very difficult to still know what that's going to turn into, but the spirit itself was very good. And we go into the warehouse and there's a, a few, maybe a hundred or so casks, and we're told... Um, we're not sampling any of the maturing stock at the moment. And I think we all at that moment in time thought, well, that's the end of our sampling today. And yeah. then we go through into this grand hall with a lovely fireplace and we're presented with three, uh, I think it was a 31, 32 and 33 year old Crag and Moore from the family's private collection. And it was, I, I well, you talk about it a lot, the epiphany moments. It was just a ridiculous moment for you to be driving. I know, I know. <laughs> but, but I had, I had the, I had the last laugh because I, I had wee sample bottles, and I was, he was offering the drums, and I was taking the drums, and and I was, I was pouring. I only took one sample bottle away, but I was pouring 
And uh, I know that that was probably not a, a very, it wasn't a very polite thing to do. I, I've just remember, I've just checked the name of the guy I was trying to, it was Brian, Brian Robinson. Brian, that's right. That welcomed us that day. Um, and, uh, and he was just willing to just hang out with us after the tour, talk about us, talk about tomato and talk about whiskey in general, talk about him and, and everything in those big leather couches there. I think yeah. the distillery was closed. He actually stayed back afterwards, didn't he? After it was closed, just to That's just right. wait once. I think as well, he hung about after it was closed for about an hour before we got there because we were running so late. Yes, yes, we were running yeah. late. Um, and he just spent um, the day with us and then poured whiskey that I, it completely redefined my opinion of Craig and Moore. Honestly, yeah. it's, one the, it's one of the biggest crimes in Diageo's portfolio, the fact that they put it out there at 40%. Um, mm. and, it, and it can be that. It can be what we experienced that day. Okay, it was a completely different thing. It was single cask. It was very mature stock. But it was, Scott, I, it was amazing whiskey. And I remember just kind of looking at Scott and Bart as they're kind of sat on the, the sofa, and they're getting to sip this, whereas I can only know it. Yeah. Um, and I could just see them just sinking back like this into the big you had a few that week, though, right? Sorry, you had a few moments like that that week. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, those uh, videos that been together are fantastic to see that as well. There's a couple of questions that come in um, for Scotch Test Dummies. Bud Jenkins has asked, um, "What is the best online store you've come across in the states for whiskey?" Scott's got that one. Uh, you know, it kind of depends. I'll hit, hit use wine searcher, wine dash searcher. And, um, you know, I'll look for the best prices. And the trick is though, finding, uh, places that ship to your locale. So, um, my wife, uh, is into Irish whiskey. The cheapest place for Irish whiskey is California by far, which I've just ordered. But the thing is, even when you use wine searcher, 10 or 12 shops will show up in California, two or three of them ship to Kansas. So you just kind of have to search and see. Now, um, international Abbey whiskey, the whiskey barrel, uh, whiskey site.nl in the Netherlands are all real good. Nobody is shipping right now to the U S or anywhere really because of uh, the coronavirus. It's shut down a lot of shipping. So I, like I say, I'll just use wine searcher, look for good prices. Um, places that are reputable or places you know you've bought you've bought or other people have bought from in the past and uh go from there yeah and there was one that came in from myself from tabitha asking with the relaxation of the the laws in cask maturation i'm going to throw that back to you guys in a minute to get your opinion on that but the relaxation in the rules around what casks can and can't be used in scotch um will will we start using tequila casks. And my response to that at the moment would be probably not for Tomatin. It's a much more traditional brand, much more traditional maturations, but it's something that we would probably look at for Kubokin. We've already released Kubokin and Shochu casks, which um, was just happenstance that the week that the, the law was changed was also the week that we released that liquid that had been matured in those casks for eight years. Um, but let me throw that back to you guys. Obviously, for a long, long time, the regulations around whiskey was that you had to be matured in a cask, Scotch whiskey, a, a cask that had a historical precedence of being used. But there was never really any set guidelines on what was historical precedence. But then last year it changed to any spirit that traditionally uses casks in their maturation, as long as it's not a stone fruit. So. What when you when you heard that news? What did you think? Did you think um, was it a negative sort of side, or we're going to lose what whiskey is, or were you excited about the possibilities? My deal is easy. I want more possibilities, just to see the differences. But that's me, Scott. Well, I'll just start. I don't want a tequila barrel aged whiskey <laughs> myself. Um, if I want tequila, I'm just going to go to tequila. I, I don't know that the influence of a tequila barrel on a whiskey would be good, you know, but then you go back, you know, is it Oak? If it's Oak, um, technically I suppose you're within the guidelines. You know, I mean, look, a lot of people probably don't like PX or Oloroso, you know, the white port, you know, the wine finishes. If, if it's Oak, it's Oak. 
so I guess along those aspects, you're okay. But me personally, I don't, I don't think I, I don't think I want a tequila matured or, or finished whiskey. I don't know. Maybe they could, maybe they'd be good. I'll bet you a peated whiskey, you take Ardbeg and you finish it in a tequila barrel. Mm. That'd be pretty good. Yeah. What about you, Roy? Ambivalence, honestly. Uh, for me, the previous in incumbent is, is incidental, honestly. If it's a good cask, a good quality cask, um, uh, I don't mind what it is. This one I'm, I'm enjoying tonight is PX. Gorgeous, luscious. This is a very decadent, luxurious experience that we're having right now. Wonderful. Um, if, if, so if a tequila cask could bring that, fantastic. If a rye cask could bring it, wonderful. But I, I echo Scott's sentiment in a way that um, if you're enjoying the Scotch whiskey because it tastes very, it tastes a lot of the previous incumbent, then why wouldn't you just go and buy the rye whiskey that was in it before? That's probably what you're enjoying. Yeah. I also think that the Scotch whiskey ind industry just now have two challenges that kind of bump into each other a little bit. The oak is becoming more precious, more difficult to get a hold of. We're very fortunate that there's a bourbon boom, boom happening at the same time, but there's not a sherry boom. So, you know, the bourbon cask supply looks fairly robust. I don't know. I'm, I'm not an expert on those things, but you imagine that it would be. Sherry cask is going to be more of a challenge. So there's probably more temptation to kind of extend the net and try uh, experimenting with different casks. That's fantastic. If it brings good whiskey, let's embrace it. However, there's already far too much variation right now. Every distillery is doing everything to all men. I understand why they're doing it. And, and occasionally they, they happen upon some fantastic serendipitous products. But I think that they should always maintain a strong, strong, solid focus on the core range and doing what they've always done very well and making it as good as they possibly can. And whatever casks they use to get to that end product is incidental to me, honestly. I just want the whiskey to be good. And if you tell me a story that that came about because it was in a tequila cask, wonderful. Um, yeah. You take I have on it. And obviously I'm very lucky to be in the position where I can go and have a look and talk to the uh, suppliers about these casks and potentially get our hands on some and have a wee play about, that doesn't necessarily mean that that will ever become a product because ultimately quality, as you say, has to be the key. Um, I think there have been a couple of instances recently, not to name names, where products have been released in these new casks that have had a very, very short finish and it's almost been done to be the first rather than to for a quality purpose. Um, but ultimately the place I get to with everything like this that happens, every question that happens is if that brings even one more person into the whiskey category, I'm happy. You know, if somebody picks up a Johnny Walker matured in tequila casks in Mexico and that's their first introduction to whiskey and then three years down the line they're commenting on a Scotch Test Dummies video or an Aqua Vitae video, that's no different from when I first drunk that during a 10 year old a few years ago. You know, that's the introduction that sowed the seeds for what would become a passion. Yeah. That's my yeah. Right. Well, Roy, you was, Roy, I think it was on your channel. You was talking to someone else too. And their first, their first intro to whiskey was Jura in the bar, in a pub. Was that on your channel? Who was that? Do you remember? It was Scott. It was me. Was it? Yeah. Yeah, so that was my first sort of, it's, it's a weird one. I, that was before I started at Tomatin. Um, and I would, I've always said that my interest, my passion for whiskey came after I started at Tomatin. That's when I started going to tastings and going to uh, actually actively trying to learn about it. But I do remember, um, it must have been maybe six months before I started at Tomatin, going into a bar with... Um, a friend of mine, Roy, and I think it was just after I proposed to my wife, or I think it was the night that I told Roy that I was going, not Roy here, my friend Roy, that I was going to propose to my uh, girlfriend, now wife at the time, um, and he bought a whiskey. Not not out of any enjoyment of whiskey, but because that was the done thing. We're in Scotland, we're mm. Scottish, there's a life moment, we should probably have a whiskey. 
Um, and it was simply the fact that Jura was on the back bar and had a slightly cool bottle compared to everything else. <laughs> and he shotguns it back, and I take a little sip of it. And I was like, oh, wow, that's very much like you, Roy. That, that's different from the stuff that I drank too much of when I was young. Um, and it, it was Jura 10 at the time. I had to go look around. I think it was Charlie McLean when you had him on. I think he was talking about when he was young and, and going to the pub and people were buying him. He'd go in there and you had to drink whatever um, other people were, were drinking or they'd buy dr rounds and you had to drink it. And I'm pretty sure it was Jura that he was talking about. Too. You could be right. You could be right. I think. You could be right. And, and, and the other thing is, the similarities end between myself and Charlie as well. <laughs> <laughs> I think that um, what happens is that, that, you know, people from outside of Scotland might imagine that all our bars are literally dripping with malt whiskey, but that's not true. You need to go into a bar that, that is known to have a, a decent malt selection. All bars will have whiskey, but it tends to be blends. They might have uh, some single malts, but there'll be, there'll be Glenfiddichs. There'll be, uh, uh, there might, they might have a peated one like a Laphroaig, and they'll have Jura. They'll have, you know, the, the the higher volume brands that are recognized. And that's what will be behind the bars in, in most places, unless they curate a malt selection, um, you know, for whatever I mean, reason. You, um, you're lucky even if they have the local dram. Yes, you know, that's true. Yep. That, that's a lucky thing that if you walk into a bar and they've got the local distillery, because a lot of the time, I mean, Flora and Fauna is a good example. A lot of the time, these whiskies do not ex exist in a malt form. So even having that local drop but sorry Roy. no it's, it's absolutely it's true that so most of our experiences and and it's something that i'm always really really keen to remind myself of is that most of our experiences when we first come into whiskey tends to be something fairly generic and easily available it could be a jura a glenfiddich a bulveni it could be any of these uh very easy to come across whiskies and as you proceed along your whiskey journey, you look back on them and you're very dismissive. You're like, oh, now I know that to be not nearly as good. And we would do well to remember that there are people out there having very valid experiences mm -hmm. with those whiskies. And I love going back to, uh, just recently on a live stream, I started a, a blind challenge with, um, and I often do it with a Glenfiddich 12, um, just because it's solid and it's consistent and reliable and it's still a very, um, good quality product. Um, what, what we enjoy as whiskey enthusiasts now is way at the other end of the scale. We have things like this. Um, and there is, there's at 50, what's the, the ABV on this? 55.5% ABV. I'm around about the same. You know, you have to be careful who you serve that to. And you have to, I think, serve this with a story. Yeah. Um, so the, the whiskey to your point there, three of the four of us started with a legacy and uh, Barrett started with the 12-year-old. We didn't start with anything mm. massively off the rails. It was a Friday night, let's have a casual whiskey. And that's what we all reached for without even having a conversation beforehand. You know, right. So even as impassioned, and I, I, I like to refer to myself as a whiskey geek, it doesn't mean that I'm going to these things all the time. It just yeah. means I enjoy them when I do have them. Yes, 100%. I got a shout out. Ben Dietrich said, so many Roy's, so little time. <laughs> <laughs> That's Ben from SMWS. So I, just yeah. I, have to, I have to say, I'm, I'm very surprised that, because Scott, we know, is that we were all shocked to find out that Scott is in his 20s. He's got a canny, much more mature head on his shoulders. So I'm, I'm assuming that Roy is maybe in his 20s too. I don't know. But Roy is very rarely on a, a young person. You know, Roy's are usually fairly old people. <laughs> <laughs> no, he is. He's, he's in his 20s as well. But um, he's he's got far less of that mature head on his shoulders. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> he's a fun-loving Roy. <laughs> That's it. That's it. One of those. One of the, he, He's kind of the Bart of our group. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. And I know that you mean that in the best possible way. Yeah. <laughs> oh yes. Well, well you, you have a uh, Cooper that's named Bart. Well, in a roundabout way, his name's Alan, but his second name is Bartlett, so he, he gets called Bart. But yeah, oh. there, when when Scott and Bart came to the distillery, I don't think Scott was surprised to find 
other people there called Scott in Scotland. But when Bart walked into the Cooperage and uh, and was introduced to Bart, it was a shocking moment. But what was also quite interesting was that Bart here, you, you're what, the best part of six foot six? True. Yeah. And Bart, our Cooper is the perfect Cooper's build, I think maybe five foot six. So it was like... It was like The Rock and Kevin Hart in a film together. It was that sort of thing. Jumanji. Yeah, it, it would be like a, a, that sort of cruel twist on the angel's share. <laughs> Russian uh, dolls. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, guys, I think that's been an hour and a half. I know Scott and Bart, you have a, a very busy evening ahead, so I'm not going to take up much more of your time so all i want to say is thank you guys very much the three of you for all the work you do out with global pandemics to build an online community i'm very glad to have been invited on both of your shows and to be able to watch them as and when i can and thank you for being very generous with your time tonight roy thank you very much for the time that you've given me and setting up these streams and for the festival as well. So uh, thank you very much and slange of Thank you, Scott. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Scott. Cheers. Thanks for Thanks, tuning Scott. in, everyone. Slange